Okay, uh, let's start today's uh, lecture seminar. Uh, thank you very much for attending this seminar today. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Dr. Nakon Che from KIST Korea. Dr. Che is a principal research scientist at Center for Biomicrosystems Brain Science Institute, KIST. I briefly introduce his background. Uh, Dr. Che received his bachelor degree, bachelor degree in chemical engineering from Seoul National University in 2004. After his graduation, he moved to the United States and received master degree and PhDs in chemical engineering from Cornell University in 2008 and 2010. He continued at Cornell University as a postdoctoral post associate. Then he moved to Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research and Massachusetts Institute of Technology as a presidential postdoctoral fellow. Since 2012, he has started his laboratory at KIST and been focused on developing enabling technology platform for various biological applications, preliminary including brain neuroscience. There is no doubt that he is a top leading young researcher in this field. <laughs> Actually, he's the author of the high standard journal papers, including Nature Materials, Nature Communications, PNS, and so on. In 2015, so Japan had a Nanotech 2015 at Tokyo Big Site. After the uh, event, he visited Keio University, and I met him first time at that time. I remember his visit very well because I personally know him in the paper regarding a vascular network construction at SHIP. It was a very wonderful time that I discussed Dr. Che at the time. After that, we had a couple of Japan-Korea international workshop, both in Japan and Korea. And last year, uh, my group also visited his group at KIST Korea. Now, Dr. Che is now staying our group for two weeks as a guest global uh, professor, and we have um, today good opportunity to, of his seminar lecture supported by KGRI. So the, today's lecture title is Enabling Technology Platforms in Vitro for Biological Applications. So let's welcome Dr. Che with big hands. Let's get started. I have an, about, about an hour or 15 minutes. I'm going to go quickly. I have a lot of slides today, so <laughs> uh, let me get started. Uh, just as Professor Onoe introduced me, uh, I, I claim I trained, I was trained as a chemical engineer here, but my career has been developed as a cross-disciplinary or interdisciplinary biomedical engineer. Uh, I, I worked uh, at a uh, pharmaceutical company as a postdoc uh, as well. Okay. So uh, since Professor Onwe covered uh, my CV, I'm going to skip it quickly. What are we, uh, who are we? Uh, I am working at the Center for Biomicrosystems. And our center is in uh, Brain Science Institute. And it's a unique situation where all PIs, faculty, staff members are all engineers, except for one chemist. So our mission is to provide engineering tools for neuroscientists or brain scientists or more broadly biologists, okay? Um, so we are, we're developing uh, various engineering tools uh, that can be used for studying uh, neuroscience. Okay. My lab um, is for developing enabling technology platforms in vitro mostly uh, for brain, and, uh, brain science and neuroscience. And I have two major research themes. One is organs tissues on chips or brain, neural tissue engineering. And the other topic is a hydrogel-based multiplex bioassays. That's for 
in vitro diagnostics and prognosis. So I'm going to cover all of these topics uh, quickly, and I, I'll try. That includes neural circuit on a chip, or blood-brain barrier on a chip, neurovascular unit on a chip, and other uh, hydrogel-based microassays to detect DNAs, microRNAs, and proteins uh, that are associated with the diseases. Okay. So the first topic, the brain on chips. So uh, current project was really based on uh, my PhD project, which was to develop embed, directly embed a, a vascular network within a hydrogel scaffold in which we, can, we could uh, seed mammalian cells as well. So these are two examples uh, with a microfluidic scaffold uh, to do temporal control and spatial control of a cellular microenvironment. So this is the green and uh, red dyes uh, exchanging uh, in a sequential manner. And then if we had a stem cell seeded in this chip, for example, microfluidic scaffold, uh, one could differentiate those stem cells into cartilage and the other sides to bone to create a hybridized uh, bone or cartilage interface uh, within a monolithic gel. Uh, and the second topic uh, was to develop uh, endothelialized microchannels directly within, within that uh, hydrogel scaffold, okay? So let's move on to, based on these tools, uh, I started uh, developing neural tissue on a chip since I, after I joined the KIST, okay? And neural tissue on a chip can be categorized uh, in, into brain on a chip or organ on a chip. And more broadly, it's human on a chip. Okay, a little, our organs or tissues in our body on a small chip, then how, how can we mimic that? How can we recapitulate microphysiology or pathology uh, into a little chips, okay? And the USA launched a huge government-driven project at, uh, in 2012. It's called the NIH Tissue Chip Program or Tissue Chip Project. And it was ultimate goal was this project was to test, uh, uh, to develop disease models and ultimately to test drug efficacy or toxicity. Then instead of doing animal experiments, can we replace those animal experiments with these in vitro chip? experiments. That was the uh, main idea. And this is a famous long on a chip example uh, developed by a Professor Dong Eun Ho, uh, who is now in uh, UPenn. Okay. And let's go back to the brain on a chip. Then a lot of people have been working on developing either blood brain barrier or BBB on a chip or neurovascular unit on a chip, both of which are involved in uh, blood vessels, okay? And for, we thought that uh, for neural tissue on a chip, uh, technologies were not quite there yet. Uh, that was back in uh, 2012 when we started this project, okay? And we reasoned uh, that there was a missing key element or aspect, and that was the anisotropic organization or directional alignment. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say these words a lot from now on, so I keep remembering this, this word, okay? So anisotropic organization in our uh, organ or tissue or in the brain and directional alignment. And this project was, uh, was not done by myself. It was done uh, by collaborating with a neuroscientist, uh, Dr. Eun Mi-ho, and her postdoc, Dr. Sun Kyung Im. And all the electrophysiology experiments were done uh, by Dr. Lee, Justin, 
Justin Lee and Sujin Oh. And these two people are my group members who, who developed the technology side. Okay. So I'll yeah, take a look at the video. Você fez alguma coisa no cabelo? Não. É que ele tá com um efeito de comercial de shampoo de mulher. Você... Sério? So, can you notice a difference between these two cases from picture and a movie clip, okay? And she's a Ueno Judy, Japanese actress. And her hair is, is not well organized or even looks chaotic. And his hair, by the way, is, looks very well organized, right? So uh, again, organization or directional alignment I'm gonna be talking about. So if we look at our body, and pretty much all tissues and organs are tremendously organized well. And these are two examples. Uh, one is heart, and the other one is brain. And these rainbow looking like fibers are actual neurons in the body, uh, interconnected each other, okay? And in the heart, the direction of the cardiac tissue is getting different as we go deeper and deeper into the heart tissue, angle-wise. Okay? So these are two uh, extremely uh, representative examples uh, regarding the anisotropic organization in, in, in the body. Okay. So uh, a lot of people have been doing culturing uh, mammalian cells and and a, a traditional way is to culture cells on plastic flat flask. And it's, it's still a uh, most widely, widely used approach. And since late 1997 or late 1990s, the concept of tissue engineering was developed by two researchers in USA. And the idea was to seed mammalian cells, uh, ex ex harvested or extracted from our body into a polymeric scaffold, biomaterial, then grow them for weeks, then replace an injured tissue or organ. Say I had an accident and I lost an ear, then uh, ex uh, extract one of my cells and then grow them in, in a scaffold and ultimately they can be placed. That was the idea. But until now, there are very, very few clinically successful cases. And uh, one of them is only bladder, okay? Uh, it, it's a little pocket uh, to store urine in our body. And that's just a, a balloon-like tissue or organ. Simple enough, but that's the only clinically successful uh, case for tissue engineering. So that means that there are still lots of technological uh, challenges and uh, difficulties, okay? So I thought that what would be the next uh, generation or uh, the way they should be aiming. Uh, and then I see that uh, it's going to be a 3D culture of cells in an isotropically organized hydrogel scaffold. So in the concept of the conventional tissue engineering, uh, cells are just randomly mixed in a biomaterial, in a scaffold. Okay? Then that's okay, but in order to uh, speed up, for example, uh, towards developing more physiologically relevant tissues or organs, 
that uh, anisotropic organization may be uh, one of useful keys or clues uh, as an uh, engineering approach, strategy, okay? And the alignment in the brain is undoubtedly uh, important. Uh, this is a snapshot of our cortex region, and there are five or six layers. And in each layer, the length, shape, morphology of neurons are all different. And some are horizontally aligned and some are vertically aligned. Okay. And obviously, in the developmental uh, stage, there can be some defects of this anisotropic organization of neurons, and that can lead to uh, psychological uh, disorders or diseases. Okay. So this means that, again, an isotropic organization is indeed important in developing brain or uh, organ, okay? So uh, what we aimed for was to reconstruct a hippocampal neural circuit in a small chip. Hippocampus in the brain is a little region that is related to learning and memory. Okay, and in the hippocampus, there are a few, a couple of circuits, microcircuits in, in the hippocampus. And one of them is a CA3 to CA1 circuit, okay? And one uh, unique characteristic of this hippocampus circuit is that neural signals are going only from CA3 to CA1 not from CA1 to CA3, it's a one way. From here to here, not here, there to here, okay? So that's the unique characteristic of this hippocampal circuit, okay? And this is the point where direction comes in, okay? And we thought that there were two uh, excellent challenges and that one of them was the fabrication of anisotropic, anisotropic yet continuous architecture within a 3D scaffold. And the second challenge was to compartmentalization of two different cell populations within the 3D scaffold. So in order for us to create a CA3 and CA1 circuit, then obviously there we need two different cell populations, CA3 cells and CA1 cells. If we mix them all together, then how, how could we make the circuit? Okay. So those are two challenges that we would like to, we wanted to address uh, through this project. Uh, so uh, the key, our key concept was to provide a uh, 3D contact guidance. And that, this can be done by aligning collagen microfibers. Okay. And collagen type 1 is a fibrous hydrogel or a fibrous biomaterial in which we can seed mammalian cells. And a lot of people uh, use this material for tissue engineering okay? but, uh, to, to culture cells in 3D. Because collagen is a fibrous hydrogel, we can manipulate those microfibers. Okay? So by pre-aligning these uh, collagen microfibers, the neurons can attach and grow, extend their neurites, axons and dendrites, to form uh, synapses, and the formation of synapses can be linked to uh, a functional neural circuit, okay? So that, that was the engineering uh, concept. And this slide is, is pretty important. Uh, if, if you can understand this slide, that that's pretty much all, okay? So if you have uh, questions, uh, let me know. 
Uh, you, you can raise your hand now. Okay. So we prepared, uh, we, we developed two different modular unit technique. Uh, the first one is we call pre-stretch, and the other one is a pre-compression. We prepare firstly a PDMS a substrate. PDMS is a optically transparent and elastic. Okay. Then we define a little well or microchannel on this PDMS substrate, and we pre-stretch from L to L plus delta L. Okay. Then we load collagen solution. It's not gelled yet. It's a viscous solution. Then we wait for a little, little while. Then we release one of these ends. Then since PDMS is elastic, it goes back to the original configuration or position. Right? Then after that, we wait another 30 minutes for the completion of gelation. Then all the co collagen fibers in this scaffold get aligned perpendicular to this pre-stretched direction. Okay. And the second modular unit uh, technique is, is to uh, pre-compress the same or more thicker, thicker PDMS uh, substrate. Instead of pre-stretching, we now pre-compress the PDMS substrate first. And load collagen, wait for a while, then we release. And now all the fibers in this collagen scaffold is getting aligned in parallel to the pre-compression direction. So these are two modular techniques to induce the alignment of collagen microfibers. And these are examples. Then the alignment, the deg degree or extent of the uh, directional alignment is uh, dependent on how much we pre-stretch or pre-compress, as you might uh, be able to uh, expect. Then this is a quantitative example of, a, we, we define the orientation index uh, expressed as uh, this equation. Then as, as you pre-stretch, much uh, more and more, then uh, the fibers are getting aligned and more and more. And uh, number one, if the orientation index value is one, it's a perfect alignment along x-axis horizontally. And if the orientation index is minus number one, then it's a perfect alignment along the vertical line. And zero is a random. So there's no uh, uh, directional alignment. Okay. And one of the advantages of this technique is that we can uh, uniformly align all pretty much all the fibers in a 3D scaffold. So this is a uh, Z-stacked uh, confocal microscope imaging uh, through 100 micron thick. Okay. And a blue uh, color-coded Fibers are all horizontally aligned. And for the pre-compression, again, red labeled and vertically aligned. Okay. Then how, how, how could we align these collagen microfibers? And that's closely related to the mechanism of the gelation. Okay. Collagen, it's it stays as a liquid or viscous solution form when it's cooled and pH is pretty low in an acidic condition. Okay? So that's, that's the point where uh, all the collagen uh, exists as a single protein. Okay? As soon as you neutralize the viscous collagen solution and increase the temperature, for example, up to room temperature or 37 degrees C, then these single proteins start self-assembling into fibers. 
or three birds. Okay. So, for example, after five minutes of duration, then there are still single proteins and a little bit of short collagen microfibers or fibrils. Okay. After these short fibrils are formed, then there's an exponential growth pretty quickly, uh, self-assemble, into long fibers. Okay? Then when single proteins are getting all consumed, then the duration is uh, going to be terminated. Okay? So this is a typical uh, nucleation growth mechanism. Okay? Then the key uh, step is to release the PDMS substrate, not here, not here, but around here, just right before the exponential growth starts. That's the golden time. And that's the key to align collagen microfibers. Okay. So um, it, it's defined as TD, uh, the partial duration time, or when do we release the PDMS uh, substrate? Then uh, uh, after waiting for five minutes, the alignment is very good, but three minutes, there are still lots of single proteins that can be uh, not aligned and self-assembled in a random direction. And if we waited too long, then already fibers are formed. So if we waited too long, there are wrinkles and buckles in the, in the bulk of collagen scaffold. And that's why the collagen uh, alignment is not that good. So um, we have to we had to uh, start seeding primary neurons extracted from rat or mice brain embryonic state, and we literally spent almost one year not to kill these extremely sensitive. Uh, primary neurons. They're, they're so sensitive, then if, if we uh, perturbate a little bit, then all the cells were uh, dead. And this is an example. Say we waited too long, then collagen fibers were probably formed as long fibers already. Then in the presence of cells seated in that scaffold, cells were probably attached through this long period of time. Then we release, right? Then that release process can affect cells' viability. Maybe okay in two hours, but all the cells were dead in three days. So that stress, uh, cells could not survive at all. So that's another reason why we, uh, we have to wait for uh, a little time. That's, that there's a golden uh, time window. Okay? And these are new rights uh, grew along, along the aligned microfibers, uh, collagen fibers. So back to, uh, back to the reconstruction of the hipp hippocampal circuit, uh, we developed, uh, we, we fabricated a microfluidic chip that has uh, three inlets here. Three inlets. So we first pre stretched from L2, L plus delta L. Then we loaded CA1 cell seeded collagen in inlet number one, and CA3 cell seeded collagen in number three, and no cell, cell free collagen in number two, inlet number two. And then by uh, withdrawing from the outlet, we were able to. Uh, create a lamina flows of these three streams, and then wait for five minutes to release the PDMS substrate. Then all the fibers are getting aligned perpendicular to this pre-stretch direction. Okay? And that's how we can have two different cell populations within a monolithic gel, but uh, all the collagen fibers are getting aligned horizontally. So this is a uh, uh, 3D rendered image after a three-week culture of a primary neurons, CA1 
three cells in one side, say one cells uh, in the other side, then red were dendrites, and green is axons. And one of the characteristics of these neurons is that once one neuron is differentiating its neurites, then there is only one long axon. And other neurites are all shorter, much shorter than the right. Okay? And a synapse is the junction between a dendrite and axon. Okay? So, so random case and aligned case. To confirm the formation of a synapse, a function of synapse, we, we stain the presynaptic marker and post-synaptic marker, and we confirm that those two were co-stained, meaning that there is one dendrite and one axon forming a synapse. Okay. And then we electrically uh, stimulated CA13 side. Recall that the direction of the neural signal is only from CA3 to CA1, not from CA1 to CA3. That's why we stimulated CA3 region with an electrode, electrically, okay? And then without pre-stretch, then collagen fibers are not aligned. They're gonna be formed in a random manner. Then the probability of the formation of synapses is getting much lower compared with the aligned uh, scaffold, okay? So with, with the uh, collagen microfibers aligned and the formation and the responses from uh, CA1 side is getting much higher. Okay. And to conform uh, the function of connectivity, we treated two chemicals. One is a TTX and the other one is AP5, CNQX. And these are all inhibitors, inhibitors. And TTX inhibits all, all the synaptic activity but in both CA3 and CA1 side. And AP5, C, and QX only inhibits the CA1 side. And we confirm uh, by, uh, by doing electrophysiology uh, experiments, we, we confirm that. Oh, okay. So as soon as we saw this data, uh, oh, these are really functional uh, synapses. Okay. To triple confirm our uh, connectivity, we intentionally aligned uh, collagen fibers in, in the vertical direction. Then uh, axons could not, in principle, could not uh, cross over this river without cells, right? So this, this dark region uh, means that there's no uh, axons sustained. Okay? And obviously, without these axons connected to uh, dendrites, then no responses from the CA1 region when we uh, stimulated uh, CA3 cells electrically. Okay. And uh, we, we now have started some collaborations by utilizing or uh, seeding uh, other types of cells. Uh, one, one example is to use a fibroblast, uh, connective tissue cells, and the other one is a myoblast uh, towards developing cardiac tissues with this alignment implemented. Okay. So from now on, uh, I should be uh, in a hurry. The second topic is a BBB, a blood-brain barrier. Blood-brain barrier is a unique uh, part in, in the brain. In the brain, people still believe that there are no immune cells in the brain. So without these blood vessels in the brain tight enough, then other uh, foreign materials can penetrate into the brain tissue and damage, right? So uh, throughout the development uh, stage, especially blood vessels in the brain are so tight that any external molecules cannot really penetrate into the brain tissue and vice versa. 
materials accumulated in the brain tissue cannot also uh, come out into the blood vessels. And people are using trans wells to test drug molecules, but that's not physiologically relevant. So um, we, we aim to recapitulate uh, the microphysiology of the brain, a uh, blood brain barrier. And this is also uh, one of the topics that Professor Onoe is working on. So we first uh, inserted micro needles and poured collagen and gelated and pulled those needles back out. And that's how we were able to create a cylindrical uh, channels, then plated onto the inner surface of those micro channels with brain endothelial cells. And then uh, we measured quantitatively uh, trans endothelial permeability from the vessels to the tissue area uh, by uh, delivering a, a fluorescent dye okay, uh, with this uh, equation that we derived. So we are currently working on co-culturing uh, other types of uh, brain cells, uh, such as astrocytes, parasites, and other types of cells into the bulk so that we can uh, mimic the neurovascular unit. Uh, we, we would like to uh, think of it as a disease model, ultimately, but uh, there are lots of uh, technical challenges as well. Okay. So the fundamental question uh, that most neuroscientists uh, are asking is uh, how, how is the central nervous system, CNS, is working and how, how does that lead to behaviors? Okay. So um, we, we think that our in vitro culture platform can serve as, as a bridge between normal state and unhealthy or diseased state. So we are, we are working on developing uh, this enabling technology uh, tools. The second topic is hydrogel-based assays. Uh, this, was a, uh, this was a technique that I learned when I was a postdoc at MIT, uh, chemical engineering department. Uh, they developed a uh, pretty fun technique, uh, which is to uh, fabricate lots of hydrogel microparticles real time by flowing photo cross-linkable hydrogel again uh, it's a synthetic polymer called polyethylene glycol diacrylate. Uh, in the presence of a photo initiator, then we, we, we form lamina flow here, then shine UV, uh, stop the flow, shine UV, and apply the pressure again, and repeat these cycles. And that, that's how we can create a lot of particles. And in these particles, we can photochemically conjugate antibodies or single-stranded DNA oligomers or aptamers even to capture DNAs, microRNAs, mRNAs, and even proteins that can be uh, considered biomarkers for diseases. Okay. So one example is, uh, is, was uh, through a collaboration between uh, us and another neuroscientist who was studying the addiction of cocaine, okay? So if we take cocaine, then our brain is getting addicted, then what, what's gonna happen? What changes in the brain is going to occur? That was our question uh, to verify our technique. Then typically this epigenetic changes uh, is through the trans, uh, post-translational modification of uh, histones. Histones are proteins, and to detect proteins, Western blood has been widely used, but to do Western blood, uh, we need a certain amount of samples, for example, brain lysate. So it was not possible to do one batch of Western blood with a single mouse. 
brain, and this is the real data, then they're all uh, statistically insignificant. That's because we see ensemble averages from multiple mice. Okay? So uh, by fabricating, again, these hydrogel microparticles, uh, in which here we call probe region, uh, we photochemically uh, conjugated an antibody or antibodies to uh, multiplex uh, detect uh, various types of modified histones then we found that uh, we were able to detect the change in translational, post-translational modification or epigenetic change uh, from mice that were fed by cocaine for one week. So compared with a col uh, control case, there was increase in acetylation in H3K9 uh, histone. Okay. And they, they, these data uh, were acquired by, uh, from uh, mouse, uh, single mouse, and at least to compare this data with a, a conventional technology, we had to sacrifice at least four mice to get the same kind of data. Okay. And we can even do uh, PCR with these hydrogel particles. Polyethylene glycol diacrylate or polyethylene glycol PEG uh, is pretty much independent on uh, temperature changes. Uh, that's why we can do PCR. Uh, in the PCR, we should increase temperature up to 95 degrees C for a few seconds or a minute and go back, back and forth. Okay? And the key uh, concept is, is to photochemically conjugate or immobilize one of primers, either forward or reverse primer into this hydrogel post. And that's how we can do the PCR and all the PCR signal stays within these hydrogel constructs. So uh, with these hydrogel posts or hydrogel uh, constructs, we can do multiplex qPCR. And that's, that's the advantage. So this is pretty much it. Uh, I'm going to spend a little more time uh, with the questions or conversations. And this is my, uh, uh, probably the last slide showing my scientific and educational philosophy. Um, it's a, yoi project wa nai. Tada, yoi project o tsukuru hitobito dake ga aru o iru dake. This is my uh, philosophy. So uh, thank you, and uh, let me know if you have questions. Thank you very much for a uh, very beautiful talk and impressive uh, topics. So uh, it's a very good opportunity to have questions or discussion in this uh, time. So please raise your hand. Thank you for the exciting talk. Um, actually, uh, in your first, I mean the first project, I mean the neuron project, mm -hmm. um, the reason why, maybe the reason why the alignment of the neuron or synapse, synapse is? Neuron. Neuron, sorry. Neuron is because of the structure, right? However, is there any possibility because of the, you know, uh, pressure? Pressure. Pressure, pressure of the, you know, um, uh, kind of the release of the PDMS or, you know. Ah, ah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, at the end of the day, mm -hmm. there's no effect uh, or negligible okay. <laughs> effect, but we had a hard time because again, these primary neurons are so sensitive, right. a little bit of pressure or stress mm -hmm. by releasing the PDMS substrate can really kill all the cells. And why, why, why is it safe now? And again, uh, in five minutes, there are still single collagen proteins and a little bit of fibers. So it's not really gel. Mm -hmm. It's not really zol. It's some between zol and zel gel. So in this zol gel transition, uh, this media serves as a cushion. So that's why cells are okay 
and five minutes, they're still floating, not attached. So that's why. So you mean maybe you think um, neural cells has no mechanical sensor? Uh, I, I think they, they have. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Thank you for the presentation. And my uh, my question is that in the uh, in the first topic, there uh, in order to align the uh, uh, align the uh, uh, fibers fibers in uh, collagen collagen. Uh, you, uh, sorry, I don't understand the mechanism of why the uh, the alignment is uh, achieved. Uh, I mean that uh, in the uh, alignment. Uh, or being the x-axis or y-axis, you mean uh, you say that uh, if you compress the uh, the alignment is like uh, or being the y-axis. Mm -hmm. What is the me mechanism? Okay, of that? so I skipped, but uh, let me show you this slide. So for the pre-stretch, say this dark line is a microfiber, short fibril in five minutes of partial dilation. And we can draw a unit volume, surrounding volume, okay? So that's already pre-stretched state. In five minutes, we're gonna release one of the two ends. Then it effectively compresses back to the original configuration, right? And that's why this uh, dark arrow is then as this, let's, let's take a look at this length. This part is getting shorter, right? Because it, it compress, it's getting compressed, okay? Then this short fiber is getting rotated this way. And that's how we pre-stretch along this direction, but the fiber is getting aligned perpendicular to the uh, pre-stretch direction. In the pre-compression, say this is a pre-compressed state, and when we release the PDMS uh, substrate, and it's getting stretched now, and the microfiber is getting rotated along this uh, angular direction. And that's why it's getting uh, aligned in parallel to, to the pre-compression direction. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you for your intriguing uh, lecture. Um, I have two questions. Um, my first question is, um, it's just out of curiosity, um, do you think it is possible to contain a single CA1 cell and a single CA2 cell and put that on the chip? I, I think that's possible. Well, say, say we have, as long as we can have a small chambers, uh, chambers small enough to contain single cells, then let's say those wells are interconnected together, then in, in one side of array of small chambers, we just uh, drop CA3 cells, and in another array of small chambers, we drop CA1 cells, and these chambers, when they are interconnected, then they can be connected. I think so, yeah. Um, how do you think we can put a single CA3 cell in a single uh, chamber inside a fluidic device? Mm, I think that can be valuable, uh, especially when we'd like to find some new types of neurons or single cell level studies. So we, we always see ensemble averages, right? Signals from multiple cells together, right? Uh, so in terms of finding new types of cells, it's, it's much more, it's, it will become much more valuable. By the way, uh, I'm not sure if these single neurons, when they are connected to each other, uh, they, whether they like it or not, 
That I'm not sure. Because based on our experiment, there's a certain range of cell seeding density. If there are too few cells, they don't grow well. If they are too packed, they don't like it. So there's some signals uh, going on between those. And we, we did not replace or refresh media every day or two days. That's not the typical case. If we refresh too often, then again, they, they are dead. So somehow, uh, they're uh, communicating each other through some biochemical factors as well. So that's why I mentioned that an array of wells where uh, in each chamber, single cell, but not just a single cell, but array of single cells so that they can communicate each other. That, that could be better. Thank you. Um, my second question is uh, for the CA1 and CA3 circuit. Um, these are two specific types of neurons. Um, do you think it's possible to do a more elaborate circuit on a chip? Uh, I would like to pursue that way as well. So we, we are currently trying to develop a corticostratal circuit. So it's a longer circuit in, in our brain. So that's definitely, the older circuits are related to neurodegenerative diseases, such as Parkinson's disease or even Alzheimer's disease and other uh, defects. So uh, that's the way to go. Uh, technically challenging, but yeah, it should go that way. Thank you. I thank you for your interesting talking. So I have a question for the final goal of organ or chip. Uh, I think the final goal, of, final goal of the organ or chip, so make like this body or chip, all of these organ chip uh, to connect. But so the human body is very complex. So if the connect all of these organ chip, but so uh, they don't build the uh, humor because a uh, human has a lot of uh, um, uh, capacity. Uh, for example, heart has not only the pumping, but also a lot of the uh, chemical signal or something. But mm -hmm. so the, in the future work, the, in this, this organ chip can cover all of the uh, capacity of human or uh, not only the capacity of uh, small, yeah, small yeah. portion or yes. important portion. Yeah, yeah. I would agree with the letter case, not the first case. Yep. I mean, obviously, uh, Professor Shoji Takeuchi at Tokyo University is going uh, towards the first mm -hmm. objective. Can we really make human mm -hmm. in vitro? Yeah. Uh, that that's uh, uh, that's a valuable way, I think, but uh, not in the near future, <laughs> I don't think. So that is why another reason why the USA is specifically aiming for testing drugs. Yes. So they they're not they are aiming to connect to various tissues and organs uh, in one big chip mm. or chips connected with the tubing. Yeah. It's That's, okay, yeah. <laughs> but they, they are specifically targeting just validating drug efficacy. Mm. So in that sense, I agree with you yeah. <laughs> that we, so, we should not uh, m perfectly mimic the entire body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think the very interesting uh, science, this field, uh, so that this, you, you told that tubing to mm -hmm. a lot of tissues, mm -hmm. but so not only blood, but also a lot of uh, another uh, human uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So maybe we need to mimic like this more. Uh, I, I don't know, I have no idea to make like these bodies, but so um, how, how long? <laughs> How, how long would it, would it take? <laughs> yeah, I don't uh, know. 
Ask Professor Onoe. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's going to take a long time, but yes. people uh, have started yeah. implementing features that have not been mm. employed yet. Mm. And that w one of the examples is, is to employ uh, lymph nodes mm. and immune system in the body. A lot of people claim that they are making disease models, including myself. Yeah. <laughs> there's no immune systems. Mm. There's no lymph nodes. It's just a blood vessels. Right? That's the current state. Okay. So by adding mm. lymph nodes and immune systems, that's the time point where, oh, we, we now start yes. to be able to make a disease model. Mm. So that's the way to go. How long would it take? I, I don't know. Maybe um, 10 years, maybe we can at least pretend that, oh, it's a, uh, a lymph I, node and an um, yeah. immune system together. I hope to read a yeah. paper <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like this. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, first, let me ask a weird question. Um, I'm really interested in, the, interested in how cells died because of the pressure in this case, because not soon after you know adding pressure but after maybe three days or you know maybe i'm not sure but three days there's mm -hmm. there's died so yeah, yeah. maybe maybe i think there has there gets some signal or there has some pressure and i'm not sure do you have any idea this case you mean yes yeah so i don't think that these cells were dead because of the pressure mm -hmm. but the stress Mm -hmm. So by 30 minutes, then mm -hmm. cells were probably attached on mm -hmm. collagen fibers already. Yes. And that's the point where mechanotransduction yes, can yes. come into, right? Yes, yes, by, yes, yes. for example, integrating. Yes. Right? Then uh, by stretching or compressing mm -hmm. the collagen fibers when releasing the PDMS substrate, mm -hmm. then cells are getting... Yeah. toned out mm. or squashed and yeah. that could lead yeah but uh it, it, is it the usual you know for cells to die because of such kind of you know uh i mean they i don't know how you can say their stress fiber is changing or something i don't i don't think that's the typical phenomenon uh -huh. for example if you used other tissue cells mm. uh, fibroblast or muscle cells yes they may like it <laughs> Because they, they are meant yes, to be yes, 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 stretched yes. and compressed. Yes. And these, these neurons are not. Mm. We, our brain is uh, protected, mm. right? Yeah, 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 in, yeah, yeah. in a uh, oh. CSF, a little liquid, and skull as well. And when we are hit by a uh, mic, for example, then we could lose our memory. Oh where I was. Oh, that's why, you know, the brain is fragile. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I see exactly. the point. And a lot of people have been researching, studying mm -hmm. traumatic uh, brain injury mm -hmm. or TBI. OK. Yeah. Thank you so much. OK, so, uh, OK, so let's uh, thank a very inspiring, exciting talk again to the Dr. Jay. Thank you very much. <laughs>